I would like to welcome to our second open lecture that is part of our SMART microscopy course. And today we are happy to have with us uh, David Dan uh, coming, not really coming, but <laughs> coming all the way from London, uh, virtually coming. And even if he's very young, I'm very surprised that you have you have a foot in many places at the same time. I think the, the, your background is a statistician, a computer scientist, but now you are dedicated to help cell biologists because you use this uh, computer vision and deep learning and statistics uh, with the all um, studying in the modeling of the compartment dynamics in human cancer cells. We thank you, you for helping us to put some order and give some, uh, some nice uh, results to, to the biology. But we, uh, you, you have done that and you do that with the Queen Mary in University of London and you still do some teaching there as well, still associated. Uh, I see as well that you are doing your PhD. I don't know whether you have time to do everything, your PhD and um, the, you know, in the King College. And also as well as a deep learning in computer vision and size group, uh, I see as well that you're helping. It would be nice to tell me how, when, at what time, 24 <laughs> hours doing that. I'm quite impressed. And today you actually are going to talk about the SPIN software that you are uh, develop. And we are really looking forward to hear you and see more. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you, David. Thanks for the kind introduction. So hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today. So I'm David and I'm going to talk a bit about um, SpinX and also appear the AI um, cloud platform for image processing. So I developed um, SpinX um, during my PhD, uh, which combines AI and mathematical modeling to overcome um, some of the challenges um, to study movements of subcellular structures in 3D um, time-lapse movies. So before I start, I would like to give a brief introduction about the field of application. So uh, we are interested in cell division. Cell division is a crucial biological process that contributes um, to the growth of tissues and organisms. So to achieve this, um, cells has to undergo um, different stages, which I illustrated here in this um, cartoon. And on top here, you can see a time-lapse movie of a dividing cell. So during metaphase, cells have to round up to create enough space to form a huge structure, uh, which we call the spindle, which you can see here outlined in red. So this apparatus has two main functions. First, um, to make sure that all chromosomes, which are represented here in green, are uh, aligned at the center of the spindle. And the second function is to position itself correctly as its position defines the plane uh, for future cell division here. And a checkpoint, uh, make sure that um, these functions uh, were carried out uh, correctly before um, transitioning uh, to the next stage. So our current understanding um, how cells move their spindle in humans as mainly through a protein complex. Um, the name is not relevant for now, but uh, yeah, this um, protein complex is localized at the cell cortex and recruits uh, motor, protein dynein, uh, motor proteins, um, such as uh, dynein. So here, as you can see a video of a dynein motor protein, which has two legs. And this motor protein, this, sorry, the dynein can, has the ability then to walk along these uh, microtubule um, filaments, which are the building blocks um, of the spindle here in red. So by doing this, I uh, can then um, generate um, pulling forces um, to um, displace the spindle. Think about like pulling a rope. And as you can imagine, the cell can exhibit a different type of um, movements. For example, it can rotate or can also move um, in a translational um, manner uh, within the 3D space that is given. However, um, we don't know yet how these movements are governed um, by the cell. So to gain a better understanding, um, we studied a spindle cortex interaction. For example, we use um, perturbation of um, various um, cortex, a cell cortex or microtubule associated um, protein and see how it affects the spindle movement. So in the lab, uh, we can image uh, living cells and their spindle. So for cells, we simply use um, bright field, um, can say here it's label free 
Whereas uh, for spindles, we usually um, have a tag, a fluorescence tag. Um, it's M cherry or, sorry here, M cherry, or we use a dye to label the spindle as well and image this in far red. And we can image it uh, in 3D and also uh, through time. And we can also image uh, multiple cells at the same time. So automated 3D imaging of uh, living cells can generate terabytes of data. However, there are some limitations that comes with it. So there's a trade-off between temporal and spatial imaging data. So which means that our data is discontinuous. There's also a delay um, due to the exposure time or um, the mechanical movement of the stage if you want to visit different um, cells. And spindles, they move quite a lot. So we face also motion blur or we have frames that are out of focus. And lastly, um, we have to make our samples that we image are quite sensitive. So we have to make sure to keep uh, phototoxicity um, in check. So we can't image as frequently as we want. Otherwise we would interfere the system or we, in, in the worst case, we would kill the cell. So with SpinX, we tackled um, two challenges. Uh, first challenge is um, to benefit from deep learning, we need data. So however, access to high quality and especially biologically meaningful data, imaging data is quite difficult. And the second challenge is um, due to the um, discontinuity of the data, there's a lack of measurements for capturing um, 3D details um, through time. <clears throat> SpinX, so we developed um, SpinX, uh, it's a framework uh, which consists of um, four modules. We have an AI module, for the prediction, the objects, then we reconstruct um, the 3D structure of it. And then uh, we use uh, 3D modeling and tracking to um, consistently um, track the object through time. And finally, the 3D analysis. <clears throat> so to address um, the first challenge, uh, we generated uh, hundreds of uh, single cell high resolution movies of human cancer cells. And for the annotation, we have two user groups, uh, naive users and experts from the field um, for pre-annotation and also refinement to make sure that the annotations are correct before we process them um, through the deep learning model. And we also um, developed um, automated um, segmentation pipelines um, based on more conventional image processing approaches um, to support manual annotations. So here, for example, you can see uh, a reverse active contour model, which can be used to um, outline uh, the spindle um, boundary. So then we trained um, deep learning models um, with the goal to segment spindles and the cell cortex accurately. And we also include um, spatial and temporal imaging data as well. So our software solution successfully passed um, benchmarks through computational matrix. Um, so here we use the IOU, the section of a union, which is a metric um, to examine the overlap between the prediction uh, mask and with the ground truth. Here are just representative images um, uh, at different IOU levels. In red, you have the ground truth and in yellow, you have the prediction. We also carried out um, expert evaluation so we went through uh, each individual um, image and cl further classified the prediction into different error classes um, to gain a better understanding of what these IOU score means um, practically. Uh, lastly, the um, final experimental outputs, um, for example, we can, can then measure um, the rate of movement of the spindle confirmed to be in alignment um, with existing biological uh, literature. So to tackle um, challenge two, uh, we took then the input um, from the AI module and utilize um, ellipsoid fitting. As um, you can see here, so the in red, um, you have the prediction mask and the ellipsoid fitting is then here in green. And since we have fluorescence um, tag on the spindle, we can use properties of the point spread function um, to reconstruct on a pixel level, the structure of the spindle. And here you can see um, the whole model, how it looked like. Um, the 
here in RGB, so in red, green, blue are the principal axes um, of the spindle. And in gray, you have then the reconstructed um, cell cortex. We then use principles from um, ray tracing and point tracking um, to model spindle dynamic consistently um, through time. So we are not tracking only a single point on the skull of the spindle, for example, the centroid, but we try to capture all the um, extrema um, of the uh, structure itself. Um, this is just a demo video, how it looked like. Um, so here you have a raw image merged um, of the cell cortex with the spindle. Here the cell cortex is outlined in blue. Here on the right side, you have then the complete model and here in magenta, those um, points or pixels, basically are pixels that will be estimated with the um, PSF um, properties and fitted with an ellipsoid. And the corresponding um, life plot you can see here uh, measures the pole cortex um, 3D distance. So how far the uh, individual poles are from the cortex and, uh, yeah, through time. And we can do this for pole one and pole two so individually. So there are other challenges that we face um, and you may know as a software developer and I just want to mention um, some of them that were important for us. So um, the software from academia often have a short uh, lifespan. It could be because of uh, the dependencies of certain libraries that are outdated or simply because um, there are platform um, operation, plat operation system restrictions. So you, you can't run it on Windows or Mac at the same time. Second is um, scalability, which is often limited and due to hardware and software requirements. And third, um, what seems so easy for a software developer um, to set up and to run the code and to adapt it to our needs, uh, it may be difficult for other users in the lab um, with no coding experience, but still want to use our software. So fortunately, uh, we got them in touch uh, with uh, appear, which is a, a cloud platform for image processing. And I just want to highlight a few of the points uh, how appear um, benefited us. I think you will also hear a, a proper introduction um, later on after this one. Um, so appear provides cloud computing. So you have access to CPU and GPU, and that helps us in terms of scalability, but also it maximizes um, compatibility. So we can access um, uh, appear through any web browser and in turn can access Linux through every web browser. Um, appear supports Docker uh, technologies, which means that all the modules that are developed on appear are containerized, which improves the lifespan of um, the module. And third, um, it comes with a graphical user interface. So it helps to get easy access um, to parameters and also for the import and ex export function. So personally, um, some other things that I like um, is the deep learning annotation tool and the multi-stack viewer, which I found useful for manual correction, not only for annotation. Um, and also um, with Spinex on the peer, um, we can run Spinex along with a size uh, microscope due to the possibility to integrate it uh, in a Zen uh, environment. Um, we successfully implemented most bits of uh, Spinex on the peer. So these are just some screenshots. This is like the workflow of the modeling bit, takes the raw images and the mask images. And here is uh, here you see the UI, um, which with the access to the parameters that are needed for the um, Spinex AI module. Um, future directions of Spinex. So the next big step for Spinex is we would like to um, expand the software application to analyze other biological systems. Um, at the moment, we just tested in human cells, but we would like to expand that on that. And this can be helpful for a pharma research, like drug screening, et cetera. And for this work, we recently won the KTP award um, supported um, by the Innovate UK and SAIS and we will advertise the postdoc position for this project um, soon. And finally, I would like to thank all the people at the Travian Lab here at QMUL, 
and team at uh, up here at Zeiss, and also my collaborators, um, Chris, Sunny, and Nishant, and of course, uh, thanks to um, the sponsors, my funding bodies, BBSRC, EPSRC, Lido, TMUL, Kings, and Zeiss. Thanks for listening, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much, David, for such a nice uh, presentation. Now we open the floor for questions, and I'm going to start by the questions that we received through the Q&A. Um, so one of the questions that we have there is, um, what was the resolution of the images that you had uh, for your particular experiments, and what microscopes were you using? Um, resolution, um, can you maybe specify that? Um, do in, you mean the image resolution? Or in, terms of, resolution? Uh, in, in terms of the voxel, so what was the pixel size? For example, were you working with uh, a confocal microscope that had a particular pixel size and set resolution? Yeah, so, so we use uh, Delta Vision, not confocal, and, okay. so, and the convolution microscopy. And the pixel size, how much was it? Uh, I think it's... Uh, 100 nanometer uh, in uh, XY and 200-ish in, in Z, can't remember. But the voxels are uh, usually um, set up at 512 pixels times 512 pixels times 512. Thank you. And then uh, on the ellipsoid fitting part, yeah. um, do you require uh, 3D stacks with large steps size and then extrapolate the whole spindle from there? Or are you limited by what is your resolution in the axle? Yeah, so um, let's go quickly back to here. Yeah, so the, the, the issue that we have is we have only three slices. So we have a huge gap between the set slices and the, basically we, uh, we try to fit uh, along those uh, with these informations that we have. And important maybe to, uh, to say is that this and um, there are different types of ellipsoid fitting. So you can fit like with um, um, PCA or, um, but this one is minimum volume and closing um, ellipsoid fitting. So which means that every particle or every pixel that was detected from the SpinX output, prediction output, um, will be included uh, in the voxel basically. Perfect. And perhaps just one clarification. So because people was asking again about the, the pre-processing that you do to your microscopy images before you put them through the network, could you please repeat a little bit what was done to the microscopy images? Mm. Uh, you mentioned the convolution and uh, what else was there? Um, for the training data set or... Um, Sorry, could you please? So let's say what, what steps did you do from acquiring raw images at the microscope? Until we, you... we fed them in. Uh, the only thing that we did was um, time point normalization because we have time lapse uh, movies and um, I think also um, Z stack alignment, but that's all. Uh, otherwise, we fed the raw images, basically the raw image into the model. All right, and um, then uh, one other interesting question within this context would be somebody that is interested in doing uh, or implementing your software. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you recommend that they start with, for example, somebody that doesn't have exactly the same microscope as you, perhaps they have a confocal microscope. Yeah. Uh, so then what would be the steps? Do they have to uh, retrain the network or how they would go about it to be able to use it? Um, so I, I don't think that a so retraining will be um, um, will be implemented as well or available on the peer as well. But I don't think that we uh, that that is necessary if we already tried on uh, different subcellular structures first to be able to, to see whether we can pick up the spindle and uh, we can. So I would just um, test it out on on confocal images first to see if we can um, predict it correctly without retraining. Sorry, we, we are requested again some clarifications about which microscope did you use? Maybe uh, uh, sorry. they missed it. Yeah. Uh, deconvolution, Delta Vision, but we didn't deconvolve the images. So these are non deconvolved images. So basically, it's bright field. Thank you. Um, so while we wait for some other questions from the attendees, maybe if the panelists would, uh, would like to have a comment. Not from my side. I would like to know, you said that you are going to implement it for others. Uh, that, have, you, have you tried that as well? Um, we um, implement 
Do you mean the deep learning part? Yes, I mean you said that now you're doing the spindle and you look at, but you want to use the same use the same uh, program you had developed for other uh, problems, I guess as well. Yeah, this is the... and what kind of dynamics? So the whole framework we tested first in human cells. So we can just um, claim that it works in human cells to a certain extent. And um, but with the KTP um, award, we want to expand that further. We haven't done that yet. This is like the next step to um, to test it on uh, other um, biological systems or okay. in other biological. Oh, systems. I see. In other biological yeah. systems, but also still on the spinning, not not in other dynamics. Uh, no. No, it's both. So if the, the thing is, um, let me quickly. So um, maybe let's go back. We have to so, wait until you publish the whole thing, and then we can store the data. Yeah. <laughs> you're hiding. So, you're hiding the good data now. <laughs> uh, so basically, um, the improvement or the ex uh, to to make it applicable for other systems, we have to improve the AI module. Oh, I see. And uh, the but once we have that information, um, we can just reuse the, the other modules um, as well. So that's why the KTP award, that project, upcoming project, uh, will be focusing, uh, will focus on um, acquiring uh, mm -hmm. high quality images um, and to retrain the model based on the model that we currently have on humans. So that's basically the idea. Yeah, thank you. So, I think, Rafa, there are other questions in yes. the chat. Unfortunately, people have put questions in the chat, not Q&A, but I will go to them. So uh, we have a few questions in the chat, and one of them is related to Appear. Perhaps, David, I know that you are not an Appear developer, but you can help as a user. Sure. Uh, asking if with Appear, all your data is always in the cloud, or perhaps the following question would be, is there any way in which you can run Appear locally instead of having to use the cloud? A, yes, so you can. So. They have a, a module, um, it, it, usually you, you use it as a debugger. So it's called a module um, debugger um, that um, the appear developer um, developed um, to test basically um, uh, the module locally. So, but you can still use that for to, to execute it locally. Instead of debugging, you use it just yeah to run it locally. So that's possible. And also the code. So before you put it into a module um, container, that code uh, you can still use it usual, um, as usual and run it um, locally. So I think we have a comment from Marion on this front. Uh, yeah, probably uh, Sebastian will know better than me, but there is a version. This is called um, the uh, appear on site where you can have yeah. the data locally and then just download the, um, the workflow mm -hmm. from the internet. Thank you, Maya. So um, we have also, uh, although you already mentioned that your plan is for people not to necessarily have to retrain their networks, but uh, somebody is asking um, that uh, how is uh, how easy is to implement the, the training of the models and the predictions, and if the users can correct or add annotations easily to improve the model. Um, so um, the retraining part, um, I'm, I'm, we are not sure yet um, whether we um, want to make it public or not, because this project is, um, as I said, this is the KT3 project, so we haven't decided on, on that yet. The prediction itself um, should be easy to access, just upload your own images and see. Um, but yeah, but you need, the and you need the retraining module in order to be able to retrain the model and to improve it further. Thank you. Um, then there is another question regarding to the sample and if you had to correct for uh, sample uh, motions or movements you in acquisition. But if I understood correctly, all the distances that you're measuring is the spindle versus the envelope, right? So they are relative in a way to the shape of the cell. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's like a, from a biology point of view, that's a key feature because in the past, when we study spindle, we just look at spindles, how it moves in 2D, for example. Um, but since there's a restriction in space, how much it can move, it's important to be able to reconstruct the cell as well, so that we are able then to, to understand spindle movement relatively um, to the cell cortex. So basically to the space, because once the, for example, once the spindle is too close to the one side of the cell, it can't move further. So it, the movement is uh, usually in the other direction. So. 
then uh, we also have a, 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 another question. Let me see if I understand this one correctly. So he's basically uh, asking if in, in, in your case, what you have done is the 3D uh, semantic segmentation of the spindle uh, with uh, some micrometer resolution, but you are not extracting information inside the chromatin or protein motors travel along the micro. No, no, no. And um, just to clarify, it's not semantic segmentation that we're doing, um, doing uh, instant segmentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then we have one question. Um, uh, they are wondering if uh, you have compared your uh, segmentation models, I guess, uh, because other parts are not included, but uh, with other software around such as zero cost uh, DL for microscopy, uh, for example. So have you, have you done some uh, comparison? Uh, the comparison um, we've done on architectures rather than on on uh, on platforms. So the zero um, um, cost um, DL uh, is a, more or less a platform. So we haven't compared against them. We have compared more against um, like UNET, um, the, the original architectures. Uh, and then I think we still have a, a little bit of time for this one. Uh, the one another question we have is. Uh, what was the size of the training data set that you used uh, for training your model? And a follow-up question would be, apart from the spindles, what else is trackable, given that spindle evolution has a very distinctive formation? Is there anything else that you can track? Um, okay, so the first question, um, I think the training data set, because we, we trained two uh, separate models, um, has um, 1,400 images, I think, for the training. And the second question, um, we, um, yeah, so what we did is um, at the moment uh, we trained it on tubulin. So the tubulin um, proteins uh, that forms the, uh, or the, is the component of the microtubule filaments. Um, but we were also able um, to uh, segment um, other uh, microtubule associated proteins. So the proteins that are co-localized on the microtubule as well. So uh, we tried with Astrin, we tried um, with um, EB3 as well, and it was possible to do that. Perfect, thank you very much. So I think we have covered uh, most of the questions posed in the Q&A. Uh, again, if the panelists have any other comments before we close this session. No more questions. Maybe I will just allow one question from my side. Um, when, you, <laughs> when you are doing the, 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 the spindle segmentation, and of course, sometimes they move fairly quickly, um, I'm wondering, is there any time a risk where you confuse the poles, where they suddenly flip pole A to pole B? So yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so the movement is not that fast that it happens within our time interval. Um, but the, one of the limitations that we have, and this is also one of the things that we want to improve for the KTP project, is if the spindle flips um, perpendicular, like a complete flip, and because then the poles are completely out of focus and we don't know uh, what happens there. Fortunately, it's unlikely. So uh, it's, uh, we can um, artificially um, add an inhibitor to force this kind of behavior. So that's why we can then create um, data sets um, to improve the model. And we can also uh, use more temporal information, uh, sorry, more spatial information to really re capture um, this, so what's going on on the top and on the bottom plane. So, but this will be on the KDP um, project, um, not for this one. Perfect, I thank think, you very much. I think we, I don't allow you more questions, Rafa. You can, <laughs> you can put it in the QA and we send it to David. Thank you very much, David. At some Thanks. point, you were 121 people. You were very, and we have a lot of questions, means that people is interesting. We're looking forward to hear you maybe next time when you have the full story. Yeah. And you are, if you are allowed, just everybody know that we have recorded the session. I mean, if people want to hear it again and want to hear the answers as well, or maybe have more questions to David, of course, you are welcome. And with this, I would like to thank you, everybody, and all the attendees and the panelists, and especially to you, David. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.